Hello everyone, this video will be titled The Pelagian Empire. It's my first attempt to record like this, so hopefully it goes well. This will be an introduc introductory video to the Pelagians, and I will explain at the end of this video what will come next. First off, how did I learn about the Pelagians? Before I can get to that, I have to go to this map. Now, over the last three years, I have been going through a sort of awakening process. There are many definitions for awakenings, but my definition is literally activating or accessing the library of information encoded within our very genetic DNA. Now, it is not easy because we live in a world of duality and the majority of all that we're presented is a lie. Now, earlier, actually in January of last year, I became convinced that this is where I must go. This would be my destination. This map with this place in the very center, Polus Arcticus, was where I was supposed to go. Why? Because in the last three years I have become aware that there is a shadow power, if you will, controlling all aspects of society in a religious, in a political, in a governmental, in a cultural, in an every aspect of society way. I won't even get into television and smart technology of today. But the idea was that I came to conclude that Earth is alive. And because it's alive, it has a consciousness. And this consciousness represents all the inhabitants of this plane of existence. And I figured that this system of control that has been instituted has somehow disconnected us from the consciousness of Earth. And I felt that perhaps if I was able to get to this place, I would be able to have a conversation with Mother Earth herself and find a way to make this world right. Is it crazy? Perhaps. But that's literally what I wanted to do. And as such... About four months ago, I took a trip to Saskatoon, which is in Saskatchewan, a province in Canada. And I had intended to walk from there all the way to Polus Arcticus. Now, science or scientists say that this place is at the North Pole, but I was convinced it was actually magnetic north. So I was literally just going to follow my compass all the way north to where the source of the electromagnetic frequencies emanate that create this attraction to north. I don't want to get into that. And I will come back to this map. I will just make one note over here. There's an ocean called Oceanus Sipicus, Key at Mare Tadim. This is crucial in understanding what I will talk about next. So anyways, I ended up in Saskatoon. I was there for about a week. And I realized after meeting a wonderful human being who helped me in ways that I can never thank him enough. I realized that this is not where I was supposed to go. He told me he's lived there for 60 plus years of his life since his birth. And he never felt a connection to the land. That is when I realized it dawned on me as I was sleeping in my tent. The only place I ever felt a connection to the land was the Carpathian Mountains. Why? Because that's where I was born. And we will sp I will speak a lot about the Carpathian Mountains as I progress through this storyline. Anyways, I became so convinced that I was not supposed to continue that trip that I returned 
to my starting point here in San Jose, California. And thought, man, I invested heavily in getting there. And now I have to return. And even though I have all the material possessions I need, I don't have the finances necessary to fund another trip to Romania, to the Carpathian Mountains, where I would be, where I'm supposed to be going. However, since I'm a very spiritual person, I, I have felt and will continue to feel that the will of the universe will provide the necessary path for me to get back there, assuming that I pay attention to the signs. This video being recorded on this date of January 11, 111, 2019 is a testament to that because I haven't finished reading the book that I will mention, but I felt I had to get this message out today. So I returned and I figured, well, okay, I'm stuck here for a while. I have no intention of becoming a slave to make money. I have no desire to make money. The best I can do for now is to start training, which means putting on my backpack and taking long distance walks as training. Upwards of 50, 60 pounds. And at the same time, try to research everything that I can find that lets me know why I need to go back to Romania. And that is when I became reintroduced to the idea of the Nag Hammadi library. I became very curious if there's anything stated anywhere about any single significance in, in Romania, the Carpathian Mountains specifically, that meant me going back. Anyways, I came across the Enuma Elish. And this was a story presented by Billy Carson, I believe is his name. Let's see. Yes, this was the one. And as I was listening to this very interesting tale presented by this individual, Billy Carson, I became fascinated with what he said, but more importantly, towards the end of the video, she mentions the Bucheji Mountains, of, which are a section of the Carpathian Mountains. She talked about it for two minutes at the end of his video. And I'm like, wow, there's someone speaking about the Bucheji Mountains in Romania? What? So I wanted to figure out more information about what he says. So I searched for other videos that he may have been part of. And I came to a video where he's part of a panel. Let's see. What I'm doing right now I'm just, is I'm just giving credit where credit is due. He started this journey for me. But there was someone else. Uh, he was on this panel of four individuals. It was mostly some lady talking. That lady who spoke most of the time, she's the one that mentioned the Pelagians initially. It was the first time I heard the word Pelagian.
Probably should have done this ahead of time, huh? Anyways. I think Karen was her name. Welcome to the Total Wireless Store, where total confidence awaits. I am... So, there's also a, a, a... To the light, to the under... It just, you know, uh, I never got to the main part of the truth. Boom, that's the one. And the person that mentions that is this lady, Karen Patrick. I didn't really look into her because once she mentioned the name Nikolai Densushanu, I literally went to research who this man was. So then, Nikolai I came across to this man and obviously we could put the as the first place where we all go nowadays, right? So let's see what we could put has to say. Nikolai Densushanu lived from 1846 to 1911. Right there. I take an interest in this man because of the whole mud flood theory, right? That something happened in the early 1800s that kind of reset the world. So for this man to be born in 1846, that means he saw the world right after this reset. Does this mean he has knowledge of what happened during the reset? Who knows? Anyways, he died in 1911. He was a Transylvanian, later Romanian, ethnologist and collector of Romanian folklore. He was a corresponding member of the Romanian Academy with a specialty in history. His main work for which he is chiefly remembered was the posthumously printed Dacia Prehistorica, which means ancient Dacia in English, with a preface contributed by C.I. Strati. A facsimile edition was published in 2002 by Editura Arhetip Bucharest. That's the book that I found online. I'll get back to that. In Dacia Prehistorica, Den Sushanu combined the studies of folklore and comparative religion with archaeology to construct a theory about the prehistoric cultures of Dacia. The work has drawn criticism for unprofessionalism and evidence of nationalism and for standing at the source of protochronism. That means... It's a Romanian term describing the tendency to ascribe largely relying on questionable data and subjective interpretations and idealized past to the country as a whole. Blah, 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 blah. I'm guilty of the same thing. <laughs> Mainstream scholars regarded his book as fanciful and unscientific. His works hypothesize the existence of a Dacian-centered Pelagian empire created in the 6th millennium BC, or about 8,000 years ago, in which he claimed was governed by Uranus and Saturn and comprised all of Europe. Then Sushanu, who believed that Latin was a dialect of Dacian, also argued that the Dacians migrated to the Italian peninsula in the antiquity, where they laid the foundations of ancient Rome. And then if you want to read his biography, as they say, go ahead. I will not do that because, well, I will be translating this book that he wrote, this Dacia Prehistorica. I have the copy on my desktop. This is it. As you can see, there are 
1,284 pages total. Dacia Prehistorica de Nicolae de Sushan. And this book The preface by Dr. C. I'm assuming it's Dr. D. R. C. I. Istrati. It's literally a biography of who the man was, who Nikolai Den Sushan was. And this was published in Bucharest, Romania in 2002 online. That's the ISBN number. This is a translated this as this is a reproduced edition if you will of his work and it appeared first in Bucharest in the Institute of Graphic Arts called Karol Gobel and the rest is the address Oh yeah, Bucharest, 1913. And this was the man in his young days, whom I see as a hero today. So this was 1876-1877 at Brasov. By the way, I was born very close to Brasov too. <laughs> and this was him in his later days. Right before his death. Anyways, I have read over a thousand pages of this book. I only have a little bit more left. And I was so fascinated by all that he said that I I have to translate this book. I have to. Now uh, keep in mind. When I initially looked for this book, there wasn't many copies available. The only copy I could find was this link. Now, if you're interested in this link, go ahead, look at it, copy it, whatever. It takes a while to load, so I'm just going to close it now. Now, if you look on the internet now, and type in Dacia Prehistorica. Oh yeah, that's right. So when I looked for it initially, I was trying to get it for Kindle or Amazon. And if you go to, see even now, if you go to Kindle, it says price zero. And if you try to download it, it does not exist, which is really weird. However, since I found it, there have been other links that have appeared, which I, so I became aware of this book about two months ago. Initially, there was the one download link that I mentioned. You could not get it on Amazon or Kindle or whatever, and there was no other links. Ever since then, I have left comments on YouTube videos where I referenced some of the material in this video. Ever since then, somehow, multiple links have appeared that talk about this book, which did not exist before. It's just fascinating. It's like the AI of the internet saw that, hey, wait a minute, someone's talking about it. Let's make it available for everyone. But here's the issue I have with that. Why was it available in great detail only after I mentioned it? What happened in this last two months? Why couldn't this have happened since 2002? Why did it take 17 years for it to become a subject of interest? Just because I'm talking about it? I don't know question marks but anyways there are other places where you can get it there may even be an English translation already however considering I wasn't able to find them initially I have to assume that these translations are somehow biased to the pure work that the man wrote I will give you the unbiased 
clear, absolute translation that I can possibly give. Now then, we know who the man is, who are the Pelagians. Let's see who Wikipedia says the Pelagians are. The name Pelagians was used by classical Greek writers to either refer to populations that were the ancestors or forerunners of the Greeks. And as you will notice a lot in his book, let's go to a later page, let's say 300. Doesn't say him. Anyways, in this section where there's the title for specific sections, you will you will see um, the words proto latini proto latins. That's what the Pelagians were, proto latins, which is the same thing as these saying as Wikipedia saying the ancestors or forerunners of the Greeks, or to signify all pre-classical indigenes of Greece. In general, Pelagian has come to mean more broadly all the indigenous inhabitants of the Aegean Sea region and their cultures, a whole old term for any ancient primitive and presumably ind indigenous people in the Greek world. Now, right there, you have to understand that a lot of what you learn is based on Greek mythology. Also, Roman mythology, also any other mythology that predates the Greek and the Roman empires. Now, this is a Wikipedia map of the Mare Aegeum. It doesn't really tell you much, does it? It shows Lemnos, which was an island mentioned a lot in the book. He shows a lot of different things which have different names over different times. Anyways, if you look at this map, Rom Romani, which is Romania today, is at the very top northern part, which means that if you go back to this map, This area, or rather this Mercator map from the 1500s, is actually this area. I will speak a lot about that because it's mentioned a lot in the book. I have another map which is extremely important. It's called the Carta Pomponius by Pomponius Mel. This map is about 2,000 years old. In this map, there's Asia, there's Africa, and there's Europa. So the map should really be turned around on its side because the top of the world or north would be in this area. And if you look closely over here, there's the name Hyperbore. Or I'll just leave it at that for now. But also, if you look at this map, you also see Sificus Oceanus, which is right next to Scythia. But Scythia was not just there. This is the Caspian Sea of today. You should look at a map today, see how different it is. And here, the Pontus Exinus and the Aegean Mare and this Paulus Maeotis, whatever this is, are all connected. If you look at a map today, you will see a Black Sea and the Aegean Mare is totally different. More so, Creta, Crete, is an island. But if you look at a map today, this section is Turkey of today. 
So in essence, the geography of ancient Greece was different than what it is today. And if you look closely, there's all these islands. Check out this islands. You have one central island and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven around it. Tell me that happens naturally. And I will tell you, you gotta think harder. <laughs> Anyways, based on this map, this area is Greece, as you can tell, Phoenicia, Palestina, Judea, Damascene, blah blah. Egypt. And then you have Ethiopia seems to have been very big back in the day. You also have the Jatuli and the Egypti and Libis, Egypti. Now, all of this is mentioned later on, but I guess I'll just give you a preview now. The Jatuli and the Libyans were the first people to colonize Africa, or at least northern Africa. And if this is the Africa of the past, then if you look at a map today, the whole continent continues, right? But this is it. This is all we have. And we have islands in the ocean. So you can't say that this was the only explored part of the world of Africa and then show islands. And then you have also Atlante here. But does that mean that's the Atlantis that everybody thinks of? Not necessarily. And I will prove to you why as I read the book. Anyways, this map, which is turned on its side, is a good example of the Pelagian Empire. Now, there are other maps that I came across. Let's see which ones. <laughs> oh, this is a good one. I was looking for a place called Be Beotia. This is the Tracius. Okay, so remember that section at the very top where I said that's Romanian? That was Tracia back then. Macedonia was right next to it, and it was called the Tracian Sea and the Aegean Sea. Now, if you look closely, look at all these freaking islands. All of these islands, do they still exist today? Hmm. Check them out one by one and tell me if they exist. But the idea is. That there was Thrace, Macedonia, Thessaly, Epirus, Illyria, Aetolia, Achaea, Boeotia, where Thebes is, and Oracle of Delphi was here in Thebes, I believe. That also is important. There's the island of Rhodes, where the Colossus of Rhodes supposedly was. And this area is on the other side of the Aegean Sea, which is, well, Turkey today. I think it was, no, I know it was called uh, Asia Minor, this whole area. It was called Asia Minor. In fact, there's another important map. Ooh, this is a good one. It's called the Tabula Peutingeriana. This was a Roman map, actually. I'll go into great detail about all of these eventually. But anyways, this supposedly was a copy. By the way, look at that. Tula Insula. Huh. This was a copy of a Roman map, which showed all the major roads of the Roman Empire. So if you think of this area as Spain of today, 
and this is the coast of northern northwestern Africa then all of these locations are the land that the Roman Empire encompassed you should check it out Tabula Peltingerana you can find this on Wikipedia Oops. now what's important about this map now is to understand that this map shows the Roman Empire all the way to Where is it? It's hard to read this because it's all Latin and I don't speak Latin. <laughs> Okay, so this is Hyberia. Could have sworn I. Party, parried. Hmm. Where is it? Anyways, you see a lot of scythe, scythe, mons katakas, whatever that is. Bactria. This is named a lot. Bactria in the book. He talks about a lot. I could have sworn this showed India somewhere. That's what I was trying to show you. Hmm. Oh, there we go. So Mesopotamia. So this Roman map had roads all the way to Mesopotamia. See? Mesopotamia. And this is where Babylonia is. There it is. But if you go further past Mesopotamia, you get to the land of modern day India. Anyways, I'll have to go in more detail about this later when I have more understanding. See, it's still a learning process for me too. This was Arabia. Oh, another important thing was, where is it? Constantinople. Constantinople is actually the home of the old religious center of the world. Here it is, Constantinople. It's very important and I will talk greatly about this later on because it makes a great difference. Look at this, Pelagus. You see that? Pelagus. So this is called, I think it's called Adriatico, Adriatico Pelagus. So the point of this map is even though it's not an accurate map of what the world looked like back then, it's definitely a map that shows that there were connections between the worlds of the Roman Empire, the Arabian Empire, the Mesopotamian Empire, and to the north, the Thracian Empire, the, and other empires. I don't want to give too many details. What's more important to understand is the idea that everything is connected. Like for example, Mesopotamia. 
this was the world of back then okay so we have the black sea we have the caucasus mountains which is part of asia today but you will notice that there's also the the caucasus mountains around here and we have the caspian sea we have asia minor this is where all those islands I was talking about were. And you have this area, which today is modern Iraq, but back then was, I guess, the Fertile Crescent, Assyria and Acadia. And see, Nineveh. So in essence, all the, all the Sumerian myths, see, Sumer, Ur, Eridu, Urukuma, Babylon, it's all here above the Syrian desert, Arabian desert. But the point is it was connected to the Mediterranean Sea or the Aegean Sea of the past. So the world has changed a lot ever since then. And that's why we're unable to connect the dots today because everything is seen as separate episodes. We have the Babylonians, we have the Egyptians, we have the Romans, we have the Greeks, we have the Thracians, we have the Byzantine Empire. There are many separate aspects of history, but they're all disconnected. What this man did with this book is he connected them all. And if you read what Wikipedia has to say about him, including the fact that most scholars in his time discredited him as being a fan. I don't care what anyone else had to say about him. The idea is this. Look, let me show you something. Every page you wrote has references on it to other books. Like, for example, this is a reference. Notice how it's in Latin. I cannot translate that, but the point is that this is the book. Cantemiri Descriptio Moldavi, edition 1872, page 15. So if you know Latin, go ahead, read that book, and you will see what it has to say that this man translated. Not everything is translated in, into Romanian, but... Enough of it is to understand what he's talking about. Look, another reference. Hasdel, the, the Dictionary of the Historic Language. And, okay, let me rephrase that. This is a Dictionary of the Historic People and Languages. And then the edition and then the page number. Then another book called E.B. E.B. Here's another reference, Ki Kurti Rufi. Again, Latin. Anyone who speaks Latin, please translate this for me. <laughs> Herodot, his books, his works. Cartal High, La France Prehistorique. This is a French history book, page 315, by the author Cartel High. So what am I trying to point out here? That the man used hundreds, if not thousands of books as references to write this one great opera, as he calls it. Herodot, Quint Curtiu, Strabonis, who else? Pierre, Ovidi, Pindari. Pindar, that's a that's quite a character too. Tabula Peltingeriana, segments, whatever. But that's the map I was just showing you, the the Roman map. And what else is important about the Roman map? It shows 555 cities of antiquity. Well. What I think the author, what I think that Clyde Densushano did is he researched the history of all those cities to figure out their 
backgrounds and ethnic backgrounds and culture and how they're connected to their neighbors and who their ancestors were and so on and so forth. So the man did an amazing job of piecing together all the books he found in his life to compile this one book. And to understand how he gained his knowledge, you do not go to Wikipedia to learn who the man was. You read the, the preface written by Istrate to understand who the man was because that biography tells you his life really up to the point where he died and that's the first section that I will translate now then the last thing I want to include in this video which probably took far longer than it should have let's see 40 minutes holy crap is a table of contents of what this book is about so it starts on page 125 everything prior to that is the preface by C. Strata. I have to read that so you understand who the man was. So in the first section she talks about the times prior to the Pelagian Empire and off the bat he starts talking about Apollo, the Hyperbereans, uh, Apollonic legends of the Hyperbereans, Ochano, which is the ocean in historic traditions, which before there were the oceans of the world, there was only one ocean. She talks about the Celts, the Celts briefly. He speaks about the Insula Leuce or Snake Island as it's known today. He speaks about the White Monastery with nine altars, which is, he also calls it the, tradi the Romanian tradition about the primitive temple of Apollo from the island of Leuce, also known as White Island, also known as Snake Island today. He speaks quite a bit about that. He speaks about the megalithic monuments of Dacia. Now you have to understand, Dacia today is understood as a group of people that used to be on the land of Romania. Now you could say I am a descendant of the Dacians. However, the way he speaks about the Dacians encompasses literally the people of the known world. So Dacia in the sense of this book, is the entire Pelagian Empire. That's why I can't say it's all oh, just one dislocation, but I'll explain that later. He speaks about <clears throat> ancient monuments that portrayed the Pelagian divinities. He speaks about Saturn, you will come to realize Saturn and Uranus, just so you know. Pelasgus is the name for Uran. Uran is also known as Uranus, the planet in the sky. That's important to understand. He speaks a lot about locations, the people that inhabited those locations. He speaks a lot about Prometheus, who was very important in Dacian myths or Pelagian myths. He speaks about Atlas. And just so you know, if you've ever wondered where Atlantis is, just know it is the kingdom of Atlas. So wherever Atlas lived, that was Atlantis. I'll get into that later on. He speaks a lot about the Carpathian Mountains. He speaks a lot about uh, all the people of the ancient world, really. All the islands and who inhabited them. You could say that this book is a chronology of the most ancient times 
to the times of the Romans and the Greeks and briefly about who followed afterwards. What he does mention a lot is there were multiple invasions of Earth or Dacia or Pelagia, if you will. We, we'll, I'll, I'll stop right there. I don't want to give anything away. Later on, he starts speaking a lot about the Pelagians and the different islands of the Aegean Sea of today, islands which no longer exist. Eventually, he speaks about the Titans, the Giganti, the Hecaton Chiri, and then he speaks about the Arimi. He dedicates a lot of time to these Arimi. Why? Because these Arimi people are supposedly the ancestors of many places, because he literally titles it the migrations of the Ari in Gallia, the Iberian Peninsula, in Italia, in Thracia, in Illyria Vecchia, or Rash, Rassia, or Rama, in Alada. Alada is another word for religion. And the Greek world was known as a legion. Everything else was known as Tartarus. That's where Tartaria comes from. And if you want to know better, Tartar is actually coming from the word Tatan, which is the plural of word Tata, which means dad. So Tata became Tatan or dads. And eventually, through the changing of language, the letter R replaced the letter N. So it became Tartar instead of Tatan. It's, he talks about that a lot. But the idea is that common ancestor of the Tartarians, which are shown in the northern parts of Europe and Asia, and even the Americas, are the Tatans, which the origins are, well, the Arimi. He speaks about their migrations in, in Asia Minor, in Armenia, in Syria, in Palestine, in Arabia, in Egypt, or rather Northern Africa, because it wasn't just Egypt. He speaks about who these people are today, how there were several genocides when other invasions of the world occurred. In essence, he speaks about the history of our world up to a certain point, and from that certain point, I can complete his work, if you will by saying who has invaded the world in the last cycle and those same entities ruling the world today which we know as the Jesuits and the Jews this actually happened at least 500 years ago in the 1500s and well we're all slaves ever since unless you're part of them one thing that I have talked about before, which is important to know, is that the common a common description of Homo sapiens today. Okay, let's see what Homo sapiens is based on Wikipedia. No, this is not it. All right, jaw um, is a jaw. Brain case anatomy. All right. So the cranium lacks brain case brain case anatomy of Homo sapiens, who we are today, right? 
So the cranium lacks a pronounced occipital bone, the highlighted section is the occipital bone, relates to the, oh no, it's actually the back of the head, never mind. The cranium lacks a pronounced occipital bone in the neck, a bulge that anchored considerable neck muscles in Neanderthals. Modern humans, even the earlier ones, generally have a larger forebrain than the archaic people so that the brain sits above rather than behind the eyes. This will usually, though not always, give a higher forehead and reduce brow ridge. Early modern people and some living people do, however, have quite pronounced brow ridges, but they differ from those of archaic forms by having both a supraorbital foramen and or notch forming a groove through the ridge above each eye. This splits the ridge into a central part and two distal parts. In current humans often only the central section of the ridge is preserved if it is preserved at all. This contrasts with archaic humans where the brow ridge is pronounced and unbroken. So this skull right here is who we are today, okay? Notice how the brain, or rather the skull, slopes a little bit in the front. But overall, this is who man is supposed to be today. Now, if you type in common, no. Male head size, maybe that's it. All right, let's go to this. What is the average? No, that's not it. Back to Wikipedia, I suppose. can't remember where I said this, but the idea is that the normal head size of a person is if, if you take your hand, the width of your forehead should be four of your fingers. Now I am 5'11", normal six feet tall. Based on that definition, clearly, Four fingers are the size, the size of my forehead. Now, I would say that my hand is very proportionate to my body size. However, there are people out there, like the one who proclaims himself to not even be human, David Wilcock, for example. Check out his forehead. Now, if we do a side by side comparison of his head to mine, see my hand? Now, take a look at his hand. Imagine that he's doing the exact same thing that I am doing. You can clearly see in that picture that more fingers fit in his forehead, on his forehead. I would say six, seven. Now, why is this important? Going back to the invasions, which Nikolai Densushanu talks about, there have been several invasions of people that are almost like us, but not quite like us. The last one I attribute to the Jews. So anyone that has foreheads that are not the standard, are not like us, they're the invasion force that rules society today. I will speak about this in more detail after I conclude translating the book, which I suspect will take me the next six months because it's extremely difficult. And anyways, so yeah, there you have it, the Pelagian Empire. The world, the, 
the known world of antiquity. It was comprised of many peoples, but all had the same origins. The gods of Greek mythology, Roman mythology, Romanian mythology were dominant for a very long time until it all changed due to some invasion which happened in the 1500s or about 500 years ago based on what I currently know which I attribute to the Jesuits but even prior to the Jesuits there was the Jewish invasion and prior to the Jewish invasion there was other invasions now then stay tuned for future videos the first translation video will be at least an hour's worth of the book starting with page one until wherever I get to I have to translate all of the preface as well because you have to know the man behind the book so you know that he's a genuine human being that was forgotten by history on purpose because he did exactly what I'm doing he spoke too much truth.